game manager, bridge quarterback, average, washed up. All these are terms and identities that have been used to describe Jared Goff. But now, as Jared Goff continues to play lights out, a new identity is starting to potentially form. And that is that of MVP. We're going to talk about it in today's episode, folks, so stay tuned. It started with an owner who had a last name fans despised. Hiring a coach that the experts thought was crazy. But I got a plan, I swear to you. Who traded for a QB that was said to be washed up. They said the Detroit Lions would never amount to anything, that it would always be the same old Lions. But this team, our team, has a new identity, defined and expressed by the crazy head coach. Doesn't matter if you have one ass cheek and three toes, I will beat your ass. Led by the QB that nobody thought was good. Motor City Mania is in full swing and ready to start. So join the show and be prepared for kneecap biting because Motor City Mania starts right now. Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another episode of MCM Motor City Mania. I'm your host David T. Pike and we're diving in right now. As always to those that are coming back to the show, I just want to say thank you all for coming back. Thank you all for your view, your support, your patronage. Thank you all for everything that you do. And to the newcomers to the show, I want to say thank you all for giving my show a shot. Hopefully you guys enjoy the content. And with that, I also hope to gain your subscription. But to everybody, I just want to say God bless. Hopefully you enjoy the show and let's dive in. So let's understand something here, folks. I am by far the biggest golf defender, biggest golf supporter, biggest golf whatever term you'd like to use, that is respectful, mind you, but biggest term you'd like to use in regards to Jared Goff when it comes to the Detroit Lions community. When I was back on my old channel before it got taken down, DLF, I was by far, that was the biggest thing that I was known for, was that I defended Jared Goff when almost nobody wanted to. Well, we're not talking about that today. We're not talking about my track record. We're talking about how, once again, not only has Jared Goff flipped the narrative for himself, but has also flipped the narrative for everybody else. Because, again, we're not just talking about, you know, the fans for the Detroit Lions. We're not just talking about local beat writers. We're not just talking about people that do stuff that are from the local media markets, the local YouTube channels, and things like that for the Detroit Lions. We're talking about the national prerogative. We're talking about the national narrative that has completely done a 180 when it comes to Jared Goff. And what I mean by this is this specifically. When Jared Goff first got here in Detroit, there was nobody, save a very few amount of us, myself included, that thought Jared Goff was going to be anything more than a bridge quarterback. I knew Jared Goff wasn't a bridge quarterback. I knew he wasn't a transition quarterback. I knew he wasn't average. But you try telling that to almost the sheer amount of masses that bought into the false, lazy narrative that Sean McVay had put out there for years that the entire NFL had pretty much gobbled up hook, line, and sinker. Now, when we look at what it's like now, pretty much everybody has completely reversed script on this, thinking like, okay, maybe the Rams were a little premature getting rid of Jared Goff. Now the Rams are in a bind because they have an aging quarterback with an albatross contract. They're having to rebuild. They haven't been able to get any draft picks for the last couple of years because they trade them all away. All things that I have said on my channel now and past in the old channel for multiple times. But when we take a look about the biggest thing that's changed for Jared Goff, other than the narrative that surrounded him from Sean McVay and the Rams, other than the fact that when he first got here, everyone would want to call him a bridge quarterback or, you know, an average quarterback, whatever term you'd like to use, the biggest thing that has changed for Jared Goff is that people are now looking at Jared Goff as a top five quarterback. And when I mean top five quarterback, I'm not just saying, okay, he's one of the top five quarterbacks, one of the five best quarterbacks in the NFL. Now they're including a nice little three-letter title that also goes along with it. MVP, Most Valuable Player. Now, I'm not saying that he is going to win the Most Valuable Player Award. I'm not saying anything like that. But if you take a look on Google, you take a look on any sort of internet sourcing that you can find, every single time you hear Jared Goff's name, there's always the conversation piece that comes right after it that he is in the MVP discussion. That, hey, you have to now stop looking at Jared Goff as just a game-managing quarterback. This guy is a top-five quarterback. This is a guy that is in the MVP discussion. This is a guy who is a serious MVP contender. 
And when you start taking a look at that kind of a conversation, the whole mindset, the whole narrative, the whole identity surrounding somebody, it completely transforms into a completely different identity than what Jared Goff has ever had in his career. Because let's even think about this. Back when Jared Goff was with the Rams, Jared Goff was considered one of the best quarterbacks, right? But nobody ever once talked about him being an MVP candidate. That is something that is completely brand new towards his career with the Detroit Lions. And that's where we're going to start this whole identity change. That's where we're going to start this whole talking about why, in my opinion, it's not just fluff. It's not just hype. It's not just people saying, oh, well, Jared Goff's playing so good right now. We have to include him. No. When you actually take a look at the when you take a look at the information I'm about to provide here, you take a look at the evidence, there's no way in hell, there's no way you could legal <laughs> not legally, there's no way you could legitimately make an argument not to include Jared Goff in an MVP discussion. So let's dive into it here really quickly. Let's first and foremost consider this. I've talked about it before, but it's the truth. If you look at the last 16 games that Goff has been the quarterback for the Detroit Lions and that the Detroit Lions have produced, they have produced a 13-3 record. That right there ought to show you something first and foremost. When you win 13 games out of 16, you're doing something right. You are doing something right to where you are winning almost every single game you play. Now granted, this is spanned over two seasons, but again, 16 games, the last 16 games the Lions have played, they've only lost 3 out of 16. That's impressive. But think about this, folks. If you take a look at how Jared Goff has performed in those last 16 games, so the first 6 games of this year and 10 games from last year, the production is just absolutely stupendous. Take a look at this. In the last 16 games, Goff has thrown 364 completions to 541 attempts for a 67.3 completion percentage rate. He has 4,152 yards, 28 touchdowns to 4 interceptions with a 104.3 passer rating and a 68.1 QBR rating. Now, the QBR rating is me doing my best estimation based off of what ESPN does, so it's not 100% official. But again, that's what I have. But if you take a look at all those numbers, those numbers are pretty damn impressive. Over the last 16 games, Jared Goff has been playing lights out. When you throw that little amount of interceptions, almost 30 touchdowns, you've got over 4,000 yards passing, you are doing something right, without a shadow of a doubt. Now, that's just over the last 16 games. But let's also think about this, folks. Consider the first six games of this year. Jared Goff has been playing absolutely stupendous. And I said this in a previous episode. I'll put the link to that episode back up at the top here. But think about this. Jared Goff, through the first six games this year, has been playing in some ways at a level that is even better than in the 2018 season when he took the Rams to the Super Bowl, which up until recently, that was Jared Goff's best season. I would say the 2022 season was right there, but from what I'm seeing in this year, I think 2023 is going to surpass 2018. But let's just take a look at this. Let's just take a look at the side-by-side -side comparison when it comes to the statistical production that Jared Goff has done in the first six games of this year versus the six games that he started in 2018. Let's take a look at this. If you take a look at what Jared Goff did in the first eight, sorry, first six games of 2018, this is what he did with the Rams. He threw 134 completions to 194 attempts, which was for 69 completion percent. He had 1,930 yards, 9.9 .9 an average of throw, 12 touchdowns to five interceptions, a 110.9 passer rating, and again, my best estimate of a 72.1 QBR from ESPN. Now, just some things to consider also from those first six games. Jared Goff had three 100-plus passer rating games in those first six games. He had four straight 300-plus passing yard games. And he also had four straight 70-plus QBR games in those first six games. Now, that's what happened in 2018. Let's flip over now to 2023 for Jared Goff and the Detroit Lions. This is what Jared Goff has done in the first five, first six games with the Lions this year. 141 completions to 203 attempts. That's 69.5 completion percentage, folks. 1,618 passing yards. Eight in average of throw. 11 touchdowns to three interceptions. 105.1 passer rating with a 73.3 QBR. That is official from ESPN. Now think about this. 
Just like in 2018, Jared Goff has posted three 100-plus passer rating games in his first six games with the Detroit Lions. Just like in, uh, in, in 2018, he also has posted four 70-plus QBR rating games. Now, granted, they weren't four straight, but he has produced four 70-plus QBR rating games. Or QB, yeah, QBR, adjusted QBR rating games. Now, here is the main difference between Jared Goff in 2018 versus Jared Goff in 2023. Take a look at this. In 2018, Jared Goff threw five picks. So far, Jared Goff's only thrown three. But also in 2018, one of the biggest gripes that a lot of fans, whether it's, you know, whoever, that had about Jared Goff was his inability to hold on to the ball as far as fumbles. He was having fumble security concerns. Fumble security concerns. Man, I'm tripping with my tongue a little bit. But think about this. In 2018, he had the five interceptions and three fumbles. Granted, none of them were lost, but he also had three fumbles. So far, Jared Goff has had zero fumbles through the first six games of the year. He has not coughed the ball up once. So not only has Jared Goff turned down his turnovers a lot more, because he's got two less than what he had in 2018, but he's also doing a lot better job of holding on to the ball while still maintaining that excellent production, whether it's in terms of efficiency, whether it's in terms of just sheer volume of yards and stats. He's still producing the exact same way that he did in 2018, only better in terms of efficiency by not giving the ball over to other teams. So that's something that I wanted to put out there right away because it's like, listen, everybody's talking about now also is the Lions a potential Super Bowl contender. Well, in 2018, the Rams got to the Super Bowl with Jared Goff as their quarterback. If Jared Goff is playing at the same level, if not better than what he did in 2018, I think it's quite honestly feasible that the Lions could make a shot for it. I'm not saying they're going to make the Super Bowl, but they have a shot for it. So that's the comparison between 2018 and 2023 Goff. Now let's consider this. There's other stats I like to point out here. Consider also that when you take a look at PFF, PFF for a long time has been very, very bad when it's come to trying to rate the Lions, and particularly Jared Goff. But right now, PFF is actually giving Jared Goff and the Lions a lot of love. Well, think about this, folks. If you go to PFF right now and you take a look at some of their statistical analysis, the big-time throw percentage and the big-time throws itself, Jared Goff is ranked 12th in terms of overall percentage with 4.3% of his throws being considered a big-time throw. But here's what's really interesting. While his big-time throw percentage is just outside of the top 10, you want to know what he leads the NFL in? Turnover-worthy plays. And I'm talking about in the best way possible. He has the number one ranked turnover-worthy plays at the lowest percentage of 1.3%. He's number one in that category, meaning that, once again, Jared Goff's putting out big plays on the field, but he's not putting the ball in a position for where it can be taken by the other team. So let me put this in for you. Jared Goff's big-time throw percentage is 4.3%. His turnover-worthy plays is 1.3%. That's a 4-to-1 difference ratio right there. That means that for every one turnover-worthy play Jared Goff has, he's got at least four big-time plays opposite of it. Here's what I also want to point out here. You want to know what quarterback has a better difference ratio than Jared Goff? There's only one in the NFL. Only one. That's Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford has a 5.7% differential. Jared Goff only has a 4%. But otherwise, Jared Goff is surpassing every single quarterback in the NFL in terms of the difference between his ability to get big-time throws versus his turnover-worthy plays. I'm not saying that he's got better, he's got a better big-time uh, percentage as far as his throws. I'm just talking about the difference ratio between the two because there are a lot of other quarterbacks that have a higher big-time throw percentage than Jared Goff. I'm talking about the difference, folks. I want to make sure I have that explicitly clear. Now, that's one thing. Now, we take a look at this. Jared Goff is also the leader on PFF for adjusted completion percentage. Now, what exactly does that mean? Adjusted completion percentage means this. If every single pass that was on target that Goff got to his wide receivers would ca was caught, this would be what his completion percentage would be. If I recall correctly, according to PFF, it would be, what was it? I think a 60, uh, an 82.3 or something like that. Yeah, 82.3%. Just to put that in perspective, Jared Goff's actual completion percentage is a 69.5. That is a huge difference. So if you think about it, at 69.5%, Jared Goff is actually tied for fourth most in the NFL right now, right? Well, let's consider this. Not only is Jared Goff the highest ranked quarterback in terms of adjusted completion percentage, take a look at this, folks. He's also in the top 10 in terms of drop percentages. So what I mean is, 
wide receivers that are dropping his passes. This has been a problem that has plagued the Lions a little bit for the last two years. Right now, Jared Goff's drop percentage from his wide receivers is almost at 8%. It's at 7.8% meaning that Jared Goff is still playing at a very high level. He's still getting the ball to his wide receivers, despite the fact that his wide receivers are having some concerns, some troubles with actually catching the football. So there's something else I wanted to put in there really quickly. Now, this is one other thing that I saw that I really, really wanted to consider here, folks, because this was something that I actually had to kind of get a little bit squirrely with the numbers, but once you see where I'm going with this, you're going to understand what I'm talking about here. Like I said, Jared Goff this year is at a top five ranking in every single statistical category that is made by the NFL. Because think about this. Completion percentage is tied fourth. His passing yards is ranked fifth. His average per throw is ranked third. His touchdowns are tied fifth. His pass rating is ranked third. His QBR is ranked fourth. Every single category that Jared Goff has in the NFL is fifth or higher. I decided to say okay here. Let's take a consensus vote of the, you know, most people's top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Obviously, for most people, it's going to be these top 10, but there might be a couple that might squirrel their way in or out, depending upon opinion. But I said, okay, here, let's take a look at some of these other top quarterbacks here and see where each one of those rankings are in relation to Jared Goff. I took a look at Tua Tungavailoa, I looked at Purdy, I looked at Josh Allen, I looked at Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, I don't consider him top 10, but I know there's a lot of Cowboys fans that do. I looked at Kirk Cousins and I looked at Joe Burrow. I thought consensus-wise, those are most likely going to be, for the majority of fans, the top quarterbacks in the NFL. Some people might throw in Stafford, I don't know, don't really care. But the point of the matter is, I took a look at every single one of their statistical outputs and their rankings. Here's what I found out. There's only one other quarterback out of that entire list that has every single ranking that's in the top five or higher. Not Purdy, not Josh Allen, not Justin Herbert, not Patrick Mahomes, not Lamar Jackson, not Dak Prescott, not Kirk Cousins, not Joe Burrow. The only quarterback opposite of Jared Goff that has a statistical ranking that is fifth or higher in every single category is Tua Tungavailoa. And if you take a look at the two quarterbacks side by side, you'll see exactly what I mean here. Tua's got the second highest completion percentage. He's ranked first in yards, first in passing average. He's tied first in touchdowns. He's ranked first in passer rating, and he's ranked third in QBR. That's the only other quarterback in the NFL that has a top five ranking for every statistical category opposite of Jared Goff. Meaning this, Jared Goff is not just in the top five consideration. He is in an elite category that is almost entirely his own. The only other quarterback that can really touch him right now is Tua Tungavailoa. Now, that's great for Tua Tungavailoa, but the biggest hurdle for Tua is not necessarily the statistical production because we saw that last year. The biggest hurdle for him is can he continue to stay healthy because that's the biggest shoe that I'm waiting for, for Tua to have is for him to get hit and not get back up again. That has not happened yet. Hopefully it doesn't, but we're going to see what happens. Jared Goff has never had that problem. But I figured that would also show, once again, why Jared Goff being in the MVP discussion is something that absolutely must be taken seriously. There is no other quarterback that is producing at a top five level consistency, consistently across every single statistical category opposite of Jared Goff, save one. That right there deserves you being in the MVP discussion. No contest. But again, some people are not all about stats. Some people don't like to talk about the stats because they think the stats are misleading. Okay, fine. Then to wrap this all up, we'll do a little bit of film breakdown. We'll do a little bit of film analysis, some film study here. Because again, I know some people, they're not big on the whole thing about stats. So let's take a look at some logic and let's take a look at some film study here. So let's first and consider the logic before we get to the film study. Consider some of the other reasons why Jared Goff is playing at such a high level right now. Reason number one. Jared Goff has got a running game that is very, very good right now. It's very good. The only time that it hasn't been good this year is this game we just played against the Bucks. We only had 44 rushing yards on the entirety of the day. But other than that, the running game has been absolutely good. Which, what happens? That then sets up the lethal play-action passing that Jared Goff has been known for and that I have mentioned several times on both of my platforms. Jared Goff, in my opinion, once again, has, has established himself as the play-action king of the NFL because that is something that he does so immensely well off of, is play-action. So that's reason number one why Jared Goff's playing so well right now. 
Reason number two, you have to take a look at Ben Johnson, the offensive coordinator. Ben Johnson schemes up open looks and designs with a balanced attack between run and pass. He doesn't have it to be just all one or the other. It's very balanced, it's very fluid, and oftentimes it makes a lot of sense because what Ben Johnson likes to do is set up chess moves that allow, hey, we're going to have this play to set up this play, and so on and vice versa. When you have an offensive coordinator that knows how to scheme and make a game plan like that, it makes the quarterback's job immensely easier. So that's reason number two. But then, reason number three, and this is going to take us into the film analysis here in a moment. Reason number three, if you take a look at how Jared Goff has played this year on film and in the games, what is Jared Goff doing very, very well? He is doing a lot of quick read progressions, looks off throws for freaking defenders. He's finding open guys. He's keeping account of everybody on the field. He knows exactly where everybody is at all times to where there's no surprises for him. And the reason I know this is if you go to Next Gen Stats, Jared Goff has one of the quickest throwing times out of anybody in the NFL. 2.7 seconds. The average amount of time for a quarterback that's needed to throw is three seconds. So Jared Goff is getting the throw off a point at point three seconds faster than average. If I recall correctly, I think Jared Goff is ranked number 11th or 12th in that category. So again, quick reads, quick throws, making sure he doesn't put the ball in harm's way, a balanced offensive attack, and setting up that play action. These are all reasons why Jared Goff is doing so immensely well because it's an offense that is specifically curtailed for what he does very well. And we're going to see exactly what I'm talking about here now when we get to the film study because let's take a look at some of these clips here. These are all from the Buccaneers game that we just had. Just take a look at this. Let's consider this first play here. We're going to have Jared Goff and the Lions are going to be in the gun. The, the, the Lions are going to have a three wide receiver set, one tight end, one running back. So, as the play starts to run through here, here's what you're going to see. Jared Goff is in the gun. The Bucs are going to bring a blitz because they got five guys coming in on this play. And they're going to drop everybody else into a zone coverage. Now, as you've seen the play run through now for at least maybe two or three times, I want to show you this still frame. Notice here in this still frame that Jared Goff has got his arm already up and he's getting ready to go through with his throwing motion. But I want you all to pay attention here. Notice who he's throwing to. It's Amon Ross St. Brown. Amon Ross St. Brown has not even turned around his head. He hasn't even got his head turned around yet, meaning Jared Goff is not only anticipating this throw, but he's getting the ball exactly where only one, St. Brown, can get it, but also number two, it shows that Jared Goff is in full command of this offense because, again, what you want as a quarterback sometimes is to make sure that ball is out of your hands before the wide receiver's head is turned around. So as soon as that head turns around, the ball is right there, and the wide receiver can just simply catch it and run. Now, granted, St. Brown doesn't get very far after this catch, but again, you're seeing how well Jared Goff is in total command of this offense because what he's allowing St. Brown to do is to find the right place to sit down. He throws it into tight coverage where only his receiver can get it, and it's put perfectly for only St. Brown to catch the ball. Again, perfect command, perfect ball placement. This is what you expect to see out of a top quarterback, what Jared Goff is doing in this first play. Now, that's the first play. Let's take a look at this second play here. The second play, again, we're going to be in the gun. Again, three wide receivers, one tight end, one running back. Again, as the play starts to roll through here, this is what you're going to see. Goff snaps the ball. Now, what you're going to see first is that Jared Goff is first looking towards tight end Brock Wright. But what he notices is that Wright is double covered. So then he comes back to the other side of the formation and he starts looking at Josh Reynolds and Amon Ross St. Brown because they're very closely in the same area. This is a third down play. So what Goff is trying to do is he's trying to convert the down and distance. So Goff has one of two options. He can either try and get it to Josh Reynolds a little bit short and hopefully Reynolds can pick up the down and distance, which more than likely he would have. But Goff decides instead to get the full down and distance by getting it to Amon Ross St. Brown because there's a little bit more open space there. But notice this. I want you to notice two real quick things here. First and foremost, notice the quick read progression that Goff went from from right to left to get that ball to Amon Ross St. Brown. But I also want you guys to notice this. There's going to be a backside clip now. Notice where Jared Goff puts this ball placement for Amon Ross St. Brown. Because at the end of the play, Amon Ross St. Brown is practically sandwiched between two defenders. This is one area that wide receivers do not like being. They don't like going over the middle because it puts them in an exposed spot to being hit. 
and it often leads to injury. But notice where Jared Goff puts the ball when the ball gets to Amon Ross St. Brown. He places it low, so what Amon Ross St. Brown has the ability to do is to somewhat put himself in a defended position to where he's not exposed to get hit by those two defenders. Again, Perfect command, perfect ball placement of where Jared Goff wants this pass to be so he can protect the wide receiver so he can still make the catch but also not get injured. So this is once again Jared Goff exercising his complete command of not only where to put a ball on the field but also his total command of the offense and knowing where his receivers are at. So that's play number two. Now let's get to play number three here. Play number three, again, we're going to be in the gun. And it's going to, again, be three wide receivers, one tight end, one running back. But when you take a look at this play first, when it starts running through, at first glance, it looks like the Bucks are bringing a jailhouse blitz. Like, they're looking like they're going to bring everybody. But the reality is they're only bringing four guys. But again... You have to pay attention to what's going on in the field at this point. It's another third down. Goff is just merely trying to convert the downs in distance so that way they can keep the clock running because this is in the fourth quarter. They're trying to get as much time off the clock so that way the defense doesn't have to deal with the Bucks' offense for as long as they have to. Now notice what Goff does. The first thing he decides to do is he decides to look to Amon Ross St. Brown on a short out pattern here. Now, if you know anything about football, the out route is one of the most dangerous routes for quarterbacks because it's one of the easiest routes for a cornerback to jump the route and pick off the quarterback's pass and go and take it to the house. So what has to happen here is this. This ball has got to be thrown perfectly. It has to be on time. It has to be released perfectly. It has to be only where the wide receiver can get it. Because if not, this is a route that has huge risk. And again, at this point, the Lions are only up 20-6. to six. If they get a pick six here, it's going to vastly change the outcome of the game. But notice where Jared Goff puts this. Again, I'm going to throw, I'm going to put this on the front side view so you guys can see this. When the ball gets to Amon Ross St. Brown, again, the ball is only where St. Brown can get it. The only thing the cornerback can do is lunge at St. Brown's feet and hopefully just tackle him short of the marker, which that does not happen. Again, this ball is put in such a tight window to where only St. Brown can get it, and it converts the third down. Again, what I'm trying to show with these plays, the logic, the stats is this. It's not just the stats. It's not just the logic. It's not just the film. It's all together a conglomerate effort to point out that Jared Goff does deserve to be an MVP candidate. He does deserve to be in the consideration because a quarterback that's making these throws, that has the production that he's, that he's putting out on the field, and everything that's working together with this offense, that is a quarterback that is the most valuable player to a team because without Jared Goff on this Lions squad, this Lions team is nowhere near the same team. It is nowhere near the same freaking just dangerous offense. Because I can tell you this right now, Everybody that wanted to say that you could replace Jared Goff with any other quarterback, I would like to hear them make that argument now. I would sincerely love to hear them make that argument because they would look like the biggest horses but two in the world because I tell you this right now, no rookie is going to do what Jared Goff is doing right now and very few veterans are going to be doing what Jared Goff is doing right now. That's how perfect a fit Jared Goff is for this offense and it's why Jared Goff deserves to be in the MVP conversation. But anyway... That's my total body of evidence. Film, logic, stats. So that way there's a little bit for everybody. But with that having been said, I believe I presented my argument well enough. So I'm going to end the video and I just want to say thank you all for watching yet another episode of MCM Motor City Mania. If you like what you saw, I highly encourage you all to do one of these three things or all three of them. Like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If by chance you subscribed in the past and you forgot to do so at the time, or you just subscribed and you've not yet had a chance to do so, first and foremost, I'll again encourage you, make sure you hit that subscribe button. But also, please, make sure you also turn on that bell notification icon that's along with the subscribe button, so that way you never miss any more content that I push out. Again, the subscription numbers are always going up, but we want to get more people turning on that bell notification icon, so that way you never miss any more content that I push out. I also encourage y'all, please, to share this content with your Lions friends and family members. Share it here on YouTube, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, share it everywhere and anywhere that you can with everybody and anybody that you can. Let's keep spreading the channel and let's keep getting people in here to have good conversations about the Lions and football in general. And with that being said, folks, this is MCM signing off for now. I just want to again say thank you all for your view, your support, your patronage. Hopefully I gained your subscription if I haven't already. And I just want to say God bless. And until the next time we meet, I'll see y'all in the next episode.